Welcome to our service today. We're so glad that you can join us and that we can be together. Let's stand and uh, sing together to the Lord. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 6, say this. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and died a criminal's death on a cross. When God sent Jesus, his one and only son, to, to this earth to die in our place and take the penalty for our sin, we see the full extent of God's love for us. He is indeed forgiving and good, gracious and kind, slow to anger, and abounding in love and faithfulness. We pray for we. 
Well, thank you for fixing that for me. Uh, I welcome you all here today as we celebrate our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, for those of you who are guests today, I don't usually do the announcements. Um, Dennis Friesen, lead pastor here at uh, Dalmody Bible Church. We're glad that you are visiting with us, and if you're watching online, we are glad that you are able to do that with us today as well. Just want to draw your attention to a few things, and some of these are just uh, just uh, community type of ideas here that are coming out. One is that you would have received either a flock note message or seen it maybe on Facebook that we are we took all the pictures off our picture wall. We wanted to update that this year. Uh, some of those pictures were eight years old. Uh, your children are no longer babies in your hand. They are causing you problems in high school. But uh, <laughs> we wanted to change some of those pictures around. And if you as a family have a nice portrait, lengthwise, four by six, you want to just give us, give us that. And if you say, we don't do pictures and we don't take them, well, guess what? There's going to be someone at the south door right after the service, the south end by the gym, outside and they're going to be taking some pictures if you go out there quickly or you go there before you go home we'll have a shot of you and your family and we'd love to add it to the wall 
Also, next Sunday morning, uh, we have a special service. It's uh, kind of like a Harvest for Kids Sunday in the sense that uh, Dave and Jan Thiessen, who are global partners with Harvest for Kids, they are uh, bringing to us uh, a special guest who's actually visiting with us again today. But uh, Anthony Sammy, who is uh, the Children's Camp International Director for India, will be sharing with us in our service. And so we look forward to that next week. These are direct announcements I was asked to share today. Um, this afternoon, New Year Sunday afternoon sports launches from 3 to 4.30. They're today, they're not meeting in the stinky gym. They're meeting at Centennial Park to play ultimate frisbee. So if you enjoy lightly competitive sports and connecting with others, you're invited to participate. Doesn't matter your age for that. But you know what, what we need to think about this? This isn't just about us. It's a great opportunity to invite a friend or a neighbor to start connecting with some of us as friends in, in within the church context. So great opportunity for that. I was supposed to also mention regarding mini kids clubs, which are starting in October. Um, we're thrilled that so many have already registered, but there's still a need for some help in two areas. One, they're looking, Melissa's looking for one adult to help with the cooking club team, one adult to help with the cooking club. And secondly, looking for volunteers who would get involved on a snack team. Now, you don't need to attend the Wednesday night clubs to do that, but have a willingness to help prepare something for the children. If you're interested or you want to know more information, you can talk with Melissa Bueller, our children's ministry coordinator, about these two opportunities. Well, this morning, and we mentioned this last week, uh, we're celebrating a milestone event for our associate pastor, Jaden Berg, today. Five years ago, five years ago, Jaden and Jen joined our staff here at DBC. It was September 2017. Now, five years later, and two children later, we celebrate his ordination with the Fellowship of Evangelical Bible Churches. Two years ago, the elders of our church recognized the pastoral call on Jaden's life, and they recommended to the FEBC Commission on Churches that we proceed with this ordination. Now, throughout the time that we had COVID, Jaden went through a thorough study of Bible doctrine, and as we uh, met together week by week, it was encouraging to hear him wrestling with and articulating his faith as a minister of the gospel. This past spring, an ordination council gathered our church in that room over there. Representatives from several Saskatchewan FEBC churches were there, in which Jaden was required to go and undergo an oral examination defending his faith and demonstrating his aptitude of the scripture that took place for a minimum five hours. As an observer, I thought I'd be anxious, but I was quietly cheering him on, but also delighted at his ability to handle the pressure of that examination. I personally have great respect and admiration for Jaden. He has distinct gifting for ministry, and he's a valued member of our ministry team at DBC. He demonstrates growth and maturity as a leader, and he exemplifies the words that the Apostle Paul gave to a young church leader in that he continues to study and accurately handle the word of truth in his ministry in the church and to our youth and to our families in this community. Today as a church family, we welcome representatives from the FEBC to recognize and affirm the privileges and responsibilities that Jaden has been given. It's really good to have Trevor and Twyla Kirsch with us. Trevor's lead pastor at Compass Emanuel Church in Rapid View, Saskatchewan. He's also the international board chair for the FEBC. But he also just happens to be Jaden's father-in-law. <laughs> welcome here and your family. I also want to welcome Kevin and Melissa Stone who have traveled to be with us from Omaha, Nebraska. Kevin is the president of the FEBC, and I now at this time invite him to come and lead this ordination recognition. Thank you, Dennis. Good morning. 
I'm sorry, thank you, Reverend Dennis. I didn't mean to be so casual in front of your, in front of your home crowd there. Good morning. Uh, I am really glad to be here. My name is Kevin Stone, and I'm, I'm pleased to represent the FEBC this morning uh, for this proceeding. I bring greetings from the other FEBC churches around the United States and Canada, and uh, we are just celebrating with you this morning. Uh, I, di- I actually, I didn't know for sure how the order of service went this morning. I didn't know if I was before or after Dennis. That's okay. So, so Dennis is, is going to preach later, but it's really good that he let me go first. So now if the service goes long, it's not my fault. Like he, he was a little concerned that I might preach a whole sermon. I was like, I will, but it will be short. It's a short, real sermon. So we're here for a joyful occasion. We're here to celebrate Jaden's maturity, his calling, his diligent study. It's an accomplishment what he has done to become an ordained pastor within the FEBC. It's also a solemn occasion because Jaden is committing himself to the most important and urgent work a man can take. He's committing to be a faithful shepherd, a leader, a teacher, and an evangelist. Jaden, you are... I haven't even found him yet. Where are you? Oh, there you are back there. I want to look at you once in a while. And I hadn't... hadn't, Like, Yeah, there you are. Hi, Jaden. Jaden, you are now known among our fellowship as Reverend Jaden Bird. The dictionary says the reverend is one worthy to be revered. Any good reverend would distance himself from that description. We are not worthy to be revered. But one thing is to be revered, and that's Jesus Christ. And he is in us, and he is to be revered. We do revere the position of reverend. Jaden has chosen to serve God with his life and to take on a career of ministry. And as 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Jaden has studied and worked to present himself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We also honor Jen, who shares many of the trials of ministry with Jaden and anchors and aids Jaden in fulfilling his calling. So I want to take a few moments this morning to charge Jaden with the task that is before him, not with my own flowery words, but with the words of God. Do I have slides up there? I, I, I could use those. There they are. So we're going to look at 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. Um, Paul wrote to Timothy to encourage him in his work at the church in Ephesus. But it's recorded in Scripture because it's not just a specific letter to one man. It's a challenge to all of us who are in ministry. This is how God wants us to minister. So let's walk through these. Verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Paul begins this charge with a reminder of what a solemn task it is to serve God as a minister of the gospel. We're reminded that Christ Jesus will judge the living and the dead. Every person has an eternal destiny, and this should remind a minister of the urgency of his calling. And each believer will be judged for his or her actions. We should call a minister to faithful service. Paul says, I charge you by his appearing in his kingdom. As ministers of the gospel, we should share Paul's certainty that Christ will appear and establish his kingdom. And this knowledge should energize us and inspire us, inspire in us a sense of urgency at the work that we're doing. So what are we charged to do? Verse 2 says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Preach the word. It is of utmost important that we teach the word of God. Our opinions and stories can be helpful, but they are of no use compared to the eternal life-giving word of God. So, Jaden, you must faithfully teach the Bible and teach those under your care to understand and apply God's word. Be ready in season and out of season. Now, every man needs rest, and every man should seek to set aside times of rest and Sabbath rest. However, understanding the urgency of your task and caring for the flock God has entrusted you, be prepared to give of yourself, not only when it's convenient, but also when it is hard. The work of a shepherd is hard and dirty, and there is no guarantee that the pay or the hours will be great. But it's what you're called to. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Jesus showed us he was willing to leave the 99 and go after the one who was lost. The great shepherd did not simply stand in front of the flock and announce that they should follow. He sought out the one. He went after those who needed care. We are not called to simply stand in front of our flock or our students and preach the word, expecting them to follow. We are called to connect with individuals and disciple them. Teach your students what it is to be a disciple of Christ. 
Reprove them when they are missing the mark. Rebuke them when they are blatantly disobeying God. And exhort them when they demonstrate faithfulness. Sometimes this is done while teaching the students. More often it happens when we interact personally with individuals, personally investing in them as Jesus did his own disciples. Do all of this with complete patience and teaching. Jaden, you have recently been through the process of an ordination council, so clearly you're a great theologian. Thank you. I got one chuckle out of that one. But believe it or not, sometimes you will share some truth that seems obvious to you and others won't agree or understand. Be patient with your students, with their parents, and with your fellow leaders. When they do not agree, take time to teach them how you came to your conclusion. When they still do not agree, continue to be patient. Listen with an open mind. Jesus didn't say that others would know we're his disciples by our wisdom or by our credentials, but by our love. Paul goes on to describe the environment in which you have been called to minister. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. I don't think I need to explain this statement. Everyone in this room understands that this is the world we live in. This is the world we minister in. People want to hear what makes them happy, whether it aligns with the truth or not. Verse 5, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Jaden, as for you, always be sober-minded. You have been called to the most important task in history. Your work is life-giving, and you have an adversary that roams about like a lion seeking to kill and destroy. Sober-minded doesn't mean no fun. You can have fun. I know that's a relief. You can take, yep, you can take your breath down. Whew. You can have fun, enjoy life, share your joy and humor, but never lose sight of the importance of your calling. Maintain a sense of awe at the God you serve and the task you have been given. Remember that enemy who roams about. Put on the armor of God. As for you, endure suffering. Every one of us suffers, and you will undoubtedly suffer personally and in ministry. You will carry the weight of others' burdens. You will console people during their worst moments. You will find yourself trying to live up to the expectations of everyone in this room. You will encounter disagreements and all-out fights between members of your flock. You will have hateful words said about you. Satan wants to discourage you. You will suffer. I charge you to bear up under the weight of suffering, to put on the full armor of God, to allow God's strength to carry you through your suffering, and to surround yourself with those who can minister to you in your time of suffering and carry the weight of ministry with you. Jaden, as for you, do the work of an evangelist. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul said he did not come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for he decided to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We are called to present the gospel in its simplicity. We are called to reach those who do not know Jesus as Savior. We're called to evangelism. I personally believe that not every minister is called to go door to door, but every minister is called to proclaim the gospel and to seek ways in which his flock can be involved in the work of evangelism to educate and inspire his flock to have a local and global impact. Jaden asks for you, fulfill your ministry. In other words, complete the ministry to which you have been called. God has called you to serve the people of Dalmany, specifically the students, but also the flock, this whole flock. You serve them. And how would you fulfill your ministry? I suggest the best way is to focus your efforts on love. Love God. Seek Him, follow Him, acknowledge Him, give Him the glory, and seek none for yourself. Second, love God's Word. Spend time in it, meditate on it, teach from it, apply it, allow it to change your heart, ensure that it is the foundation upon which your ministry is built. Third, love your family. Far too often the servants of God find themselves too busy ministering to everyone else to minister to their own family. Protect your family time whenever possible and make shepherding them your first priority. Next, love the flock. Love the flock God has entrusted to you. Guard them from false teaching. Guide them graciously. Pray over them. Bind up their wounds. Feed them from God's word and care for their needs. And finally, love others. The people outside your flock need Jesus Christ. Reach out to them. Show them the love of Christ. Care for their needs and share the gospel with them. Jaden, if you do these things, God will work in you and through you. Your ministry may or may not grow. You may or may not experience anything that the world would call success. Whatever the case, stand firm, do these things, and you will hear, well done, 
good and faithful servant. Please know that you are not alone. As an ordained minister of the FUBC, our fellowship stands with you. Your fellow pastors, our staff, others who are volunteers are committed to serving you and helping you in any way we can. Ordained doesn't mean you have everything figured out. You've probably figured that out. But don't hesitate to reach out for help. Congratulations on this achievement. May the God of all grace and comfort be with you in every trial. May he grant you rest and peace when you are weary. May he bless this church and bring unity of purpose and vision. May he use your ministry to bring many lost souls to salvation in Christ. And may he receive the glory for all of this. Amen. Can you come forward for a minute? We have a, a small gift we're going to give Jaden. This is a, a book called The One Volume Seminary. Now, we're always hesitant to give books because pastors have books. So you're always like, maybe he already has that book, so you're not sure. Uh, but we're pretty confident. This one came out like two months ago, uh, and it was written by a friend of ours. Uh, some pr professors at Moody uh, Bible College wrote this. Uh, put it together, edit it. Mike Boyle was one of them, and he's, he's a guy who worked with the FEBC for a while, and we're friends with him. So here's a book you can use. I'll, I'll just set it here for now. And we have this lovely certificate of ordination. Uh, Jaden Berg, having been examined and approved by a duly appointed council, was ordained as minister of the gospel by the Fellowship of Evangelical Bible Churches in cooperation with Dalmany Bible Church, Dalmany, Saskatchewan, on May 31st, 2022. Congratulations, sir. Let's shake with that hand out. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> this time, Pastor Dennis, the elders, uh, and, and Reverend Trevor Kirsch are going to come up and have some moment of prayer. Uh, so if you guys would come on up here. We want you to participate in this too, in the sense that we are laying hands on him together. As we pray, would you just stretch out your hand in prayer as well as we pray? So Trevor and then Joel. Father, I thank you for Jaden. Thank you for calling him to yourself for drawing him to salvation, first of all, for redeeming his life and his soul for all eternity, and for being pleased to call him to service. Lord, I thank you for the burden that you've given to him to reach out to young people. Not everyone is given that burden. Many see it as a stepping stone to something that they see as greater and bigger. And Lord, you've given Jaden a great contentment to serve in this role, and I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would protect him. His journey is not over. The attacks are not finished. But you are sufficient for each day. So I pray that you would protect him in a special way in this next week and several weeks going forward. We know the enemy sees and we know the enemy will continue to attack. But we do not need to fear him because you are greater. So I pray that Jaden would continue to find his strength in your word, in your presence. Lord, that he would keep his priorities straight and he would serve his family. That he would be the husband and the father that you have called him to be. Lord, would you, would you be his source of strength when there are difficult days, when, when students or parents do not agree with his teaching and do not appreciate his methods? Lord, give him compassion, but also give him strength of character to walk the road that is true, even if others do not agree or do not appreciate it. Help him to have a thick skin while still caring for his flock. Lord, all these things are necessary, but they can only come by your hand. So we pray by your grace and your mercy that you would continue the work that you have started until its completion the day of your calling him home. By your return or by his death, and that he would be able to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. 
You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. In Jesus' name. And God, we thank you for the ways in which you've revealed yourself to us, for revealing yourself through your word and fully through through Jesus. We thank you for the way that you've worked in Jaden, um, for the way you continue to, to work in him and to pursue him. Um, we thank you for the way Jaden has proven himself, as, as mentioned multiple times already, to be a workman, accurately handling the word of truth. But Lord, in your word, it, where it talks about being gil- diligent to present ourselves as workmen and not ashamed and accurately handling the word of truth, you've surrounded that with words about not wrangling with words, about avoiding empty chatter. And so, God, I pray that you would protect Jaden from these things. May you protect him from, from being strictly scholarly and from, from your word being restricted to just in his head. May your word always continue to move from his head and into his heart and carry, that, carry on out uh, through his mouth for your glory. We pray that Jaden would continue to grow in his understanding and knowledge of you, but ultimately that he would be satisfied with the simplicity of knowing Jesus. May you always know that everything he needs for life, everything for, for life and godliness is found in you. And as he continues to grow in his knowledge and his relationship with you, uh, may he be a light in this dark and perverse world. May he spread goodness and hope wherever he goes, not because he is light or good or hope, but because of you. Jesus, because you are the fullness of all these things working through Jaden. And so again, we thank you for your faithfulness to Jaden. We thank you for his commitment to you and to your word. And we thank you for the way that he serves your church. We just pray you be glorified forever.
we ask the Lord to grow his character more and more in us, he often puts us in situations that we would never choose. He brings us through trials and difficulties that give, an, give us more opportunity to trust, to learn to trust him more. Well, this summer, um, we went to visit some friends in Colorado, and they like to grow, go rock climbing as a family. So one day, they took us out on an adventure. I've never been rock climbing, and to be honest, um, when I put on that harness and those shoes and that helmet, I was terrified. <laughs> they, um, they explained that once you get to the top of this, like, I don't know, 75 foot rock face, you, <coughs> you need to let go of the rock and lean back in the harness and your legs are like perpendicular to the rock face and you walk down like backwards, you know, you're looking at the rock and you're just walking down backwards. <coughs> and inwardly I thought to myself, yeah, right, <laughs> as if I'm ever gonna do that, there's no way. And you can tell I'm, I'm a big risk taker, you know. <laughs> so anyway, so I, I didn't want to really let the opportunity pass by, though. So I, I wanted to give it a try. So I went ahead and, you know, searching for the toeholds and the crevices in the rock, it was like most of the time I, I couldn't see a way forward. I just didn't know what to do next. But, um, you know, somewhere along the way, I realized that... I could really trust the rope. It would hold me, and I could trust the guy at the bottom who was, who was belaying me. So when I got to the top, I, I knew there was just no other way down. I knew that I had to let go of the rock and lean back and trust the rope. And, you know, that was the best part. It was the best part. Coming down was so fun. Um, in, the same, in kind of the same way, when the trials of life seem scary or overwhelming, as we put our trust in the Lord, we're freed up to serve him out of our weakness, depending on his strength. And that, that brings great joy. Let's sing a shout to the north and the south. strong when you feel weak in your brokenness complete shout to the north and the south sing to the east and the west jesus is savior to all
Wow, I was transported back like 18 years ago to camp. That was awesome. That was great. Loved it. Thank you. Uh, the children are heading downstairs, uh, age three to grade two for a children's church. If you're a guest here, they're welcome down there. There's also a nursery over in that corner, and they'd love to look after your children. Um, we love families. We love kids. We love grandparents. We love singles. We love you all, and we're glad you're part of this church family. <clears throat> I wanted Kevin to have the headpiece because I just didn't want it to overwhelm you, you know, with holding the mic. And I kind of feel important holding a mic today, but I don't want too much attention on myself. It was attention on the Lord. Attention. Jaden got some attention, but it's all on the Lord. So we're excited about that. And uh, I forgot I got all this paraphernalia here, and I got to get ready. I got a different remote and everything, and we're ready to go. Taryn, I'm going to turn off that mouse. That's a great day in the morning. We are so glad that you're here. Let's pray together, and then we're going to continue on. Lord, it's, it's been good to um, celebrate who you are, even the stories, even the joy that we can have, the joy and in music and in worship, the joy in seeing completions and, and recognitions, the joy that you give us. And I pray this morning that joy will flood this place, flood our hearts. Father, I pray for those today who are heavy hearted. Lift them up. Those that are seeking and don't understand this joy, open their eyes to know that you love them, you're calling them, and teach us all that, uh, that even as we heard in prayer before, take what we have in our heads and just embed it in our hearts. Unshakable faith in you, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, one of the songs that we sang, and it was the song before this one, we said this to Jesus, if all of you means less of me, take everything. Were you, did, you, did you understand the significance of those words in different ways? Less of me and more of him. That's quite an exchange. <laughs> Replace every fearful, judgmental, angry, doubting thought or impulsive reaction. Replace the quickness in me to judge others, the hesitancy to believe or act upon God's promptings. Every careless word. Every regretful response, all the selfishness and the pride that is within me, take it all and renew my heart and mind to accept what Jesus has done for me and who he declares I am in him, to love as he loves, to serve as he serves, to be absent of fear filled with peace and joy. That's a pretty fitting song and prayerful reflection as we move into the second of, for us here as a congregation, three messages focusing on the lessons that we can learn as God's people looking back from this side of having gone through what was called the pandemic. I realize there are a number of lessons we could focus on but for our sake as a congregation, I've chosen three that I think will serve us well moving forward. And they are very subjective. They're God's promptings on me. I remember back in June, getting away, being alone, and just wrestling through these things. And just feeling there comes a point when we need to talk about things that we just didn't talk about. And last week, we focused together 
as a congregation on the importance of the faith community. How important that is from what we've been through and where we're going. Because from creation to the end, consummation, community is the DNA of our identification with our creator. Community unites us because we share together in what Jesus has done through us through his death for our sins and the gift of new life. And community is the means. Community is the means by which we grow in faith and we effectively witness to this world about Jesus. Well, a second lesson that we can take, and I've, I've been hesitant about this because I'm just not sure how it's going to convey or if it <laughs> will make any sense to you. But the second lesson that I would like to share with you is that it's a lesson about the testing of our faith. Regardless of what we think caused this global event, that's not what's really ultimately what's important. What's important is God allowed it and was present in the midst of it. That's what's most important. And that brings to my mind the words Jesus spoke on what we know to be Palm Sunday. It says in Luke chapter 19, 41 to 44, strange passage for this, but just hear me out. It says there, Jesus approached Jerusalem. When he saw the city, he began, he began to cry, weep. He said, I wish you had known today what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will arrive. They will build a wall of dirt up against your city. They'll surround you and close you in on every side. You didn't recognize the time when God came to you. So your enemies will smash you to the ground. They will destroy you and all the people inside your walls. They will not leave one stone on top of another. What brought Jesus to tears was the spiritual condition of his nation. The status of his people. A people God chose and dearly loved. Jesus had arrived at Passover to bring an end the need to sacrifice animals for sin ever again. Our sinless creator was about to bear our sins upon himself to defeat the power of sin and death once for all. He knew that these very people were about to reject him and arrange for his death. And Jesus predicted in that moment that Jerusalem would fall to the Roman occupation but I just notice the key phrase in Jesus' announcement. I believe this is the key phrase. You didn't recognize the time when God came to you. Obviously, he was talking about himself, but it's the presence of God. Their expectations, their beliefs, and their priorities kept them from what God was doing right in their midst. Now, I'm not comparing the event of Jesus' death and his talking at Jerusalem to the global pandemic, but Jesus' observation fits the circumstances that the Lord allowed us to go through. I believe that together with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, our brothers and sisters within this country, this province, our community, and even our fellowship of churches, God was present because God is present. And he was at work, just as he is at work. And he allowed the testing of our faith. And he will continue to allow the testing of our faith. Now, before I flesh that out, I'd like to do some personal reflection with you. And this is the scary moment. I know this is not everybody's comfort zone. I know it's not your comfort zone. But I want to talk to you about feelings. <laughs> our emotions. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you not to say anything out loud. I just want you to process this. And it may take you a minute because it takes time to go back 
It takes time for me, a lot of time to go back to yesterday, never mind months and a couple years ago. What kind of feelings did you find yourself dealing with during COVID? What, what, which, what are the main things that arose for you, feelings? I want you to think about that. Process it. There may have been more. There may have been feelings that you felt that you'd never felt before, or there may be a heightening of feelings that you usually deal with. Have you thought of some? Don't worry, I got a list. <laughs> Would you say those feelings were healthy or unhealthy? And by that I mean, did those feelings help or did they hurt? you and others. Okay? That's the first question. We're going to get back to that. What kind of feelings were heightened in our churches during COVID? Maybe not you, but in our churches. Can you think of some different things that, that arose emotionally? Would you say those feelings were helpful or hurtful? Healthy or unhealthy? Hmm. You know, when COVID initially led to lockdowns and then the guidelines imposed the restrictions, I, I looked for help. I tried to surround myself with Christian leaders and resources that would be healthy for me and for us. I knew I needed that because I knew exactly where I'd go if I didn't have that. And I started thinking among the healthy feelings that I was able to witness and experience from those leaders and resources were feelings like these. Feelings of hopefulness that God was not surprised by any of this and that he was going to walk with me and with us through it. Um, in some ways felt energized by new opportunities to grow, learn, and change. Um, felt the creativity, maybe not me so much, but those around me, watching how God used creativity to give new perspective and reach out to new people. Um, feelings of adaptability. And I was sharing this with a group of people yesterday, the, the story of the historic American explorers Lewis and Clark, how they were seeking a waterway to the Pacific Ocean, but then they got to the Rocky Mountains and they had no more water. <laughs> they had to adapt. Last week, we talked about some of the ways that we as a church had to learn to do that, to adapt. That was something that I look back, and that was a good feeling. Reconnecting. You know, families had been so busy, they were given an opportunity to spend time together again or renew relationships with people. Spiritually, being prodded to re-engage with God and Christian community through that. Feelings of appreciativeness for strong leaders, for helpful resources, the rest God provided, valuing things that were forgotten or unknown, feeling confidence, stepping out to the unknown with God, knowing unswervingly that we're his people and we're his church. Feeling refocused in some ways. It's, it's not programs that change lives. We figured that out. It's the Holy Spirit. It's loving relationships and the Word of God that change lives. And it was a time for personal and corporate evaluation. And then compassion. Feeling compassionate. The awareness of the elevation of hurt around us during that time because of the magnitude of things like loneliness, the shared losses, the levels of frustration. Now, I talk about those, but none of them, none of those feelings mean that they could be possible for me without the presence and the work of God. Those are not man-made things. Those are not man-made outworkings for me. Those are what God does. Now, while I hope many of you shared in those feelings, I know most, if not all of us, encountered what I would call emotional challenges. 
if we had not been comfortable saying it before, or maybe even wanting to be honest enough to admit it, many of us got up personal and close with mental health challenges. And I think of what it did is also made us aware, and I don't want to minimize real health issues because I know that some here will struggle with mental health issues, but we all struggled with it in different ways, in heightened ways that we had not done before. And because of the long list and the time restraints, I'm not going to identify how they all had outworking. I'm just going to acknowledge them. And I realize when I give you this list, there might be different reasons or experiences that led you to these feelings. But this list, I think, is still only partial. And let me go through it and just let it sink in. Feelings of anxiety. Fear. Inadequacy. Feeling unloved. Misunderstood. Hopeless. Feeling helpless. Lonely. Feeling judgmental. Depressed. Exhausted. Feeling threatened. Skeptical. Feeling ambivalent, like don't care. Feeling disconnected. Feeling cynical. Polarized. Stuck. Now as I read through that list, let me just say, feelings aren't wrong. <laughs> They're our reaction to something unsettling or challenging. They're warning signs that something is not right. God created us with emotion. In fact, God is a God of emotion. But if you look at this list, that particular list, if you look at that list, unless we act upon those feelings in faith, and by that I mean allowing the Spirit of God to teach us and lead us and guide us, those feelings are disruptive and destructive to us, our relationships with families. Because you know what I'm talking about. You know where they've walked, where they've led us. They're disruptive and destructive to our church communities and our witness to this world. And we've both demonstrated and witnessed that the past two years. Now, you may regularly struggle with those feelings, and COVID just simply elevated them. Some of those feelings may have just simply surprised you and taken you totally off guard because you weren't expecting them to surface in you. But now you realize that they're there in you. I genuinely believe we've been brought through a time in which God has tested our faith through how we react, how we respond. To him in this world. In some ways, it's had a refining effect on us. It's revealed the state of our hearts and what needs to change in us going forward. I'm reminded of Jesus' encounter with some very religious people in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Religious leaders had criticized, I guess the better word would be they'd condemned <laughs> Jesus, his disciples, for disrespecting the ceremonial laws, the Jewish ceremonial laws. What did they do? they didn't perform the hand-washing ceremony before eating. And I'd say, ooh, they didn't wash their hands before eating? What do we say to our grandkids? You should go wash your hands before we eat. But there was something more about this. It was a ceremonial law. And there was more to it in their eyes. They were being judged for being unspiritual, for not washing their hands. That's when Jesus went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. <laughs> And he called out their hypocrisy. They were obsessed with their religious traditions, yet they, they disregarded the weightier matters that God had given to them to follow and make important. In fact, 
he said, doesn't the scripture command you to look after your elderly parents? And I know many of you are not doing that, but you're really obsessed about washing your hands. Then Jesus spoke directly to the crowds that were present, and this is what he said. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. For they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. Listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. What that tells us is that the responses of our lives are an indication of what's shaping and directing our hearts. And that comes in the testing of our faith. 1 Peter chapter 1 addresses a group of Christians who are going through some very challenging times. The challenge that comes to my mind that they were dealing with was, according to Peter, would be persecution. Now, as soon as I mention that word, some people, some Christians and politicians want to make that comparison with what we went through here. For various reasons, I'm hesitant to use those words. But without a doubt, I would say a lot of people, including Christians and non-Christians alike, including our neighbors and healthcare workers and truckers and churches and students and shut-ins, they've been faced with trials they've never faced before, and we've been among them as people of faith. I want to read to you 1 Peter Chapter 1, verses 3 to 9, and make a couple observations in closing to you here from this passage. And I realize it's very small print, and if you want to look at it up in your own scriptures or find it in the Pew Bible, that might be helpful to you. It says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Notice key words in this passage key words that really have to do with this whole topic. The first is hope. Hope is grounded upon our salvation in Jesus. That is what we have regardless of what we face when we know Jesus. We are given hope. It comes through our salvation in him. When we follow Christ, when we give our lives to him, when we surrender and admit that we have a need that only he can fulfill in our lives, that is, to defeat the power of sin in our life through his death and resurrection, we are given salvation. We're given new life. We become part of his family. But this hope, how is it described? It's a merciful hope. Really? Because God gives it to us in love. He says, you need hope. I love you. I'm giving you hope. It's a living hope. How is it living? It's based on the resurrection of Jesus. It's not a hope that can be overcome. Because Jesus has overcome the power of sin and death through resurrection, that hope can never be taken from us. It can't be stolen. It can't be killed. Nothing can shake or steal our hope. Look at the words that pile up. It's imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading. It is eternal. This hope, what is it translated to be? 
What is it equated to be? Faith. It's faith in God's love for us. It's faith in his presence with us. It's faith in his plan for us. It secures us and it guides us. But then we read that faith will be tested. It says here it'll be tested in many ways. Sometimes it will be like an intense fire that our faith is tested. And we're told that the testing will not always be easy. It will grieve. In fact, we'll experience real feelings when our faith is tested. What's the purpose of God allowing our faith to be tested? That that faith will triumph and God will be praised in us and to this world. So what do we take from this going forward? Our faith wasn't just tested. Our faith will always be tested. Always tested. We've had a front row seat to that the last couple years, but rather than COVID, faith will likely now be tested by something else in your life. And I don't wish any of them upon you. Tragedies, failures, Rejection, brokenness, disappointment, misunderstanding. And what will our faith lead us to do? What will it lead us to do when we feel those hurts? Will it lead us to love? Will it lead us to serve? Will it lead us to hope? That's what the testing of our faith is calling us to do. Second thing I think I take from this is we need to share our stories. A lot of you have kept your stories of how you felt to yourself and just think, well, I'll just go forward from here and that's over. No, that's important because we need to help each other heal and grow. There's been some things that happened and some relationships that were broken and there's been some uh, trust broken. There's been some failures and disappointments that we've even been involved in because of this. And there's been a lot of doubts. We need to share those stories. We need to talk about that. Because even now, as our faith is tested, do we just keep it to ourselves? Because that's why we're part of a community. We need to help each other heal and grow. Thirdly, what do we take? Not only is our faith going to be tested, and we need to share our stories, Perhaps, as a result of what happened, maybe we caused some hurt. Perhaps we need to bring resolve to situations in which testing of our faith was damaging to others. We can't just let that sit and just move past it. Maybe God needs to prompt us. Because after all, we justified the things that we did because of how we felt. But yet God wants us to be restored. And to work through this because it's part of his growth process in our lives. And so now we've come to two places, the importance of community and the testing of our faith. My prayer for you is that uh, you would take these words of 1 Peter 3 and hold on to them. Because then what's down here, that hope that we have, overflows in our lives. It overflows. And we want God to be doing that in us and through us. And so as we close today, as whatever God is speaking into you, he, he might, actually some of the feelings you might have right now, or you might be really agitated with me. I don't know. I don't say anything because I have a judging finger. I just, these are the feelings that I've seen and experienced and been part of myself. And I know that God wants us to grow with him and to continue to be his voice to this world. Let's pray together. Father, if more of you means less of me, then take everything. We want to be people of faith who hold on to what you've given us in love, that hope. Those that are struggling with it right now, who are hanging on by a thread, Lord, Help them to reach out to the community of faith. Help them just 
let you deal with it in their lives as well. It's honest, it's real. King David had a lot of feelings. I mean, there was times he wanted to kill people. Uh, but yet you got a hold of that and dealt with that. Um, Lord, please, work in our midst. Guide us and help us to also have those wonderful experiences of seeing the ways that you worked and to have the joy in our heart and, and to see all the good things that come in the midst of difficult times. Guide us and I pray that as we end this time today and celebrate together Jaden's ordination and the life we have in you, be blessed, be honored in our midst. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we dismiss, uh, don't run away completely quite away because we don't have cake, but we have cupcake to celebrate Jaden. So have a cupcake and stick around. And if you can wipe all the cookie and the cupcake off your face, go to the other side of the building and smile. And we'll have a picture of you together. So God bless. We'll see you guys again next week. If more.